and then it'll say. Oh, yes. OK, thanks. Uh, so we're just recording now. So good, good afternoon or good evening, everybody. Um, I see there's still a few people joining, so we'll just give it a minute. But you're really welcome to the webinar this evening. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I see oh, we've over 100 um, participants, attendees already after entering the room, which is really, really impressive given such a nice evening outside. And we did actually hear from a few pharmacists who had registered and said that instead they're going to choose to make the most of the sun and uh, look forward to seeing the recording. But thank you for all of, um, all of you for tuning in. Uh, our webinar this evening, Skin Cancer Prevention and Early Detection, the Role of the Pharmacist. So quite a timely and topical um, webinar for this time of year and given the nice weather that we've had um, in the last few last few weeks. And um, so it is a really, really good webinar, really interesting webinar this evening um, on a very important topic. Um, now, before I introduce you to our presenters, just a very few brief domestics to go through. Uh, microphones, try and keep them muted if possible. Videos, you can have them on or off. If you do experience problems with connectivity, it is best to turn the video off. Um, if you've any difficulty with sound, the first thing is just to check to make sure that you don't have your sound or your speaker muted or turned down. Um, the next thing to try is just to log off and log back in again. Um, if you have any questions, please use the comments box. We do hope to be able to get to them at the end of the webinar. Um, this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available on the IUP website. Um, and finally, just to let you know, we may use some anonymized information from the webinar. So there is quite a lot of content to get through. So for that reason, I'm now going to introduce you to our presenters. Um, so first, we're going to hear from Dr. Heather Burns, who is a consultant in public health medicine in the National Con Cancer Control Program. Uh, and then, next, then we'll hear from Dr. Claire Meany, who's a senior pharmacist in the National Cancer Control Program. And then finally, uh, Dr. Una Kennedy will take us through a lot of the presentation, and she's a general practitioner and GP advisor in the National Cancer Control Program. Um, so I'll hand you straight over to them. Um, Heather, you can uh, start, I believe. Thanks very much, Alicia. Thanks a million. Um, I think Audrey's kindly going to share the slides for me, so thanks very much. Um, so just the next slide, please, Audrey. So good evening, everybody. Thank you very much, Alicia, for the for the introduction. Um, so my name is Dr. Heather Burns, and I am a consultant in public health medicine in the NCCP, and I work primarily in the areas of cancer prevention and early detection. So we're really delighted to be here with you tonight to discuss the role of the pharmacist in the prevention and early detection of skin cancer. And many thanks to Audrey, Alicia, and all at IOP for giving us this opportunity to talk to you. So the National Cancer Control Programme is a directorate of the HSE that manages, organises and delivers cancer control on a whole of population basis. The NCCP was established in 2007 to deliver a programmatic approach to cancer control in Ireland and to, with the overall aim of reducing cancer incidence, mm -hmm. reducing cancer morbidity and mortality and improving the quality of life of people living with cancer in Ireland. So the NTCP has a role across the entire cancer continuum from prevention and early detection to treatment, survivorship and palliative care. So cancer has actually overtaken circulatory diseases to become Ireland's leading cause of mortality, giving rise to almost one in every three deaths in Ireland in 2019. And annual incident cancer cases are set to double by the year 2045, with a huge increase in the associated burden of morbidity and mortality. So in light of this significant projected increase in cancer cases, the role of prevention and early detection has really never ever been more important. At population level, we do know that one in every four cancers is preventable through changes to lifestyle and environmental factors. And thankfully, the importance of cancer prevention as the most cost-effective long-term approach to cancer control is increasingly recognized at national level and is highlighted as a cornerstone of our current national cancer strategy. However, despite all our best efforts towards cancer prevention, population demographics with a growing and aging population will inevitably result in an increase in incident cancer cases into the future. We can minimize this increase through prevention, but for the cases that we can't prevent, we can mitigate their impact through early detection. So if we can diagnose cancer at an early stage when it is most amenable to treatment, we can optimize patient outcomes and also reduce the associated socioeconomic cost of cancer. 
So this evening we're going to focus on skin cancer, which is the most commonly diagnosed cancer in Ireland. So I'll first hand you over to my colleague Claire Meany, Senior Pharmacist in the NCCP, and then Dr Una Kennedy will take you through the rest of this evening's webinar. So many thanks and, and over to you Claire. Thanks Heather. Um, next, um, my name is Claire Meany and I'm one of the Senior Pharmacists in the NCCP, as Heather said there, and um, I work in the Systemic Therapy um, Program within NCCP I and mean, we just wanted to give you a little insight into the ph what pharmacists do within the um, NCCP um, this evening. So the um, Systemic Therapy Program is responsible for the um, oversight um, of the National Services for the Treatment of uh, Cancer with Systemic Cancer Therapy throughout Ireland in public hospitals. And um, systemic anti-cancer therapy is um, administered in 26 hospitals across Ireland, 26 public hospitals, and it operates on a hub and spoke model with the hubs being the eight um, cancer centres and, and CHI at Crumlin, and then there are satellite hospitals acting as um, spoke, um, providing the SACT treatment. And I guess, um, sorry, um, Audrey, you can just move on the, the slide there, but I think um, but the um, one of the main projects um, the Systemic Therapy Program has been involved in is developing a model of care for systemic anti-cancer therapy in Ireland. And I guess I'm delighted to say that this is um, nearing completion and it will go to public consultation shortly. Unfortunately, it's been held up a little by the cyber crisis, but we will be going to public consultation and we would welcome all feedback would be, um, would, would be welcomed when it goes to the um, consultation and this model of care it will provide a roadmap for the development for the further development of um, SACT services um, in Ireland. Um, the next slide there Audrey please thank you. And another big body of work that goes on within the program the pharmacists are involved in has been in the development of um, national chemotherapy regimens and these are evidence-based standardized documents basically that provide guidance on the safe administration and cost-effective um, administration of systemic anti-cancer therapy. And these have been developed in close collaboration with medical consultants and other healthcare professionals. And at this point in time, we probably have over 350 regimens available that have been approved, been through the standardized process, and they're all published on the NCCP um, website according um, to tumor group. And you can see the, um, the link is there where they're, where they're available. And there is a separate section for skin and melanoma. I know this um, webinar is about early detection and prevention, but unfortunately some people do require um, systemic um, treatment. And then we have created a separate section then for the oral anti-cancer medicines, just to make it easier for those of you in community pharmacy who may be involved in dispensing of these therapies just as they're easier to find that you don't have to go looking through the different um, tumor groups to identify them. Um, and the other main use for these national chemotherapy regimens is that they underpin the national cancer information system that is um, being developed and rolled out. These are the regimens that are being built into this um, cancer information system. Audrey, next slide please. And I suppose this is just an example of what the um, regimen looks like um, on, a, on a web page. And that's just an example of an oral anti-cancer medicine that's used um, in the treatment of, of, melan of melanoma. Next slide, please. Thank you. And yes, the, the National Cancer Information System, what this is, it's a clinical information system to support the care of medical oncology and tomato-oncology patients in public hospitals in Ireland, and it will, it will be for both adult services and paediatric services. So it will provide, it's an electronic record so that it will provide access to a patient's cancer treatment record. So that would be available, available to people. And it has functionality for the prescribing, the scheduling, and the administration of the systemic anti-cancer therapy and it also provides support for the multidisciplinary team meetings, which will, which will define and direct a person's um, treatment. So, it, so that, when that's the development and the implementation of the National Cancer Information System is another 
role within the systemic um, therapy team, and it has been rolled out now in two hospitals, and um, implementation is, is moving forward. My last slide, Audrey, is just... Um, After this one? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, it's a bit sticky. I don't know what's wrong with it. Oh, yeah, there we are. That's it. Yeah, this is just <laughs> this is just a plug um for the um online course on oral anti-cancer medicines that um we developed um with, and that I with I, IOP and the NCC are delighted to be stakeholders um in this and just 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 to make you aware that it's there if you for um for further information and for understanding cancer treatment options and, and information on oral anti-cancer medicines. So thank you very much. And I'll pass you over to Una, who will take you through the, the main body of the presentation tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. Thanks, Claire. No, Una, I think you're still on mute there. Yeah, yeah thank lovely. you. Yeah. Hi, yeah. <laughs> thanks, Audrey. And thanks every, very much, everyone, for uh, coming along tonight on what is one of our few really lovely evenings in Ireland. Um, so it's great and we're delighted. Uh, thanks very much to IOP for having us here this evening. So just um, to talk about melanoma and how not to get it, I suppose. First of all, what is skin cancer? So the next slide, please, Audrey. Well, there's broadly two types of skin cancer. There's melanoma and everything else. Melanoma is the one that we fear. That's the most deadly potentially fatal form of disease. And non-melanoma comprises a bunch of skin cancers that are actually incredibly common, but tend not to be fatal. Although they can be fatal if they're left ignored. And if even if they're not left ignored, they can um, be a huge socioeconomic burden in terms of the amount of treatment required for them. But melanoma is the one that we typically worry about and rightly so. Next slide, please, Audrey. Just to talk briefly about the non-melanoma skin cancers, to give you an idea of how common they all are. For the melanoma skin cancers, we have about 1,200 cases per year in Ireland. The non-melanoma skin cancers, we would have over 12,000 per year in Ireland. And overall, skin cancer of one form or another is the commonest cancer in this country. Now, in the non-melanoma skin cancers, the commonest two of those would be the basal cell carcinomas and squamous cell carcinomas. And you don't really need to worry too much about the fine detail of those. It's just to know that they exist really and they'd be the commonest cancers. The next slide, please, Audrey. And this is what they look like. So you can see on your left is what is a basal cell carcinoma. And on your right, there's a squamous cell carcinoma. So the one on the left is a basal cell carcinoma of the ear, of the nose, I beg your pardon. And it looks fairly innocent and it could be tricky enough to spot. It's a kind of a cavitating ulcer on the skin. And I suppose what would give it away would be that the edges around the edge is slightly raised and rolled and rolled edges would be typical of malignancy. Other than that, you would say this person had a scratch on their nose. But what would give this away is the fact that it wouldn't heal. It would continue to cross over and to bleed. Um, and the other thing that would be very telling about it is it would be in an older person, typically, not typically in a younger person. The one on the right is much the same. Uh, that's a squamous cell carcinoma in the ear. You might remark on it. It looks like someone just scratched their ear. But what would tell it apart from a regular scratch on the ear is that this wouldn't heal up. It constantly crossed over. It would then start bleeding again. And over time, if anything, it gets bigger, not smaller. And I put them up, they're not too dangerous, they're not too harmful, you put them off, the job is done and people get on with their lives and everything is fine. But if they're left ignored, they can get bigger and bigger and bigger and they can become a problem. And the reason I put them up here is just to say really that the message is anything strange on the skin just needs to get removed. Now, a word of warning, the next slide is a little gruesome. Hi, Una, can you hear us? Uh, I'll yeah, I'll stop the video. Yeah, uh, can you hear me now? Oh, perfect. Can, yeah. can you hear me now, Audrey? Yes, can hear you now perfectly. Off the video. Great, thank you. So this is a squamous cell carcinoma really got out of hand. Now, this obviously should not happen. You saw the tiny little lesion on the previous slide, and now we have this. And this is a squamous cell carcinoma that has gone untreated. 
on the left there, that's somebody's ear in case you can't make it out. And on the right, you have the person's eye. It's really quite large. This would require extensive surgery to, to sort it out. And you might think this could never happen. How could somebody let something grow to this size? But I certainly have seen a case very similar to this, just a little lower on the face. It required extensive and repeated surgeries. It required skin grafting. And the unfortunate soul was left with quite a degree of disfigurement and uh, a facial palsy as a result. There's no need for it at all. Simply put them off when they're small and be done with it. So the next slide, please, Audrey. And again, this gives you uh, an idea of where melanoma sits in the scheme of things. Altogether in Ireland every year, we have 36,907 cancers. Of those, 13,300 approximately would be skin cancers. Of those, 12,000 non-melanoma skin cancers and 1,200 would be melanoma skin cancers. So the next slide, please, Audrey. Um, this is where it sits in conjunction with all the other cancers as well. If you take a look at the graph at the very end here, you can see that the commonest cancer in Ireland is prostate cancer, followed by breast, followed by colorectal, followed by lung. And melanoma comprises just 4.8% of all cancers, just over under 5% of all cancers in this country. The next slide, please, Audrey. And here's where it fits with other cancers in men and women compared. And you can see there that men, uh, it accounts for 4.4% of all cancers. And in women, it accounts for 5.3% of all cancers. Women are more likely to get melanoma. Um, don't know why, possibly that women are more likely to sunbathe. But unfortunately, men are actually, if, if they're going to die from it, men are more likely than women to die from it. Hard to know why that is. Perhaps it's something to do with genetics of melanoma in men. Perhaps it's because melanoma more commonly occurs on the thigh in women where they're likely to see it, whereas it occurs more commonly on the back in men, so they might not see it and, and pick it up. Next slide, please, Audrey. So who gets can skin cancer? Who's at risk? Unfortunately, everybody's at risk. You can see in this slide that the median age group at diagnosis is 60 to 64 years, but just over a quarter of people are diagnosed under the age of 50. And similarly, in terms of death, anybody can die from it, it's not common. It's not common in people under the age of 50. And the median age group of death is 70 to 74. So actually, the outlook for melanoma is quite good. People tend to live a long time with this disease. Next slide, please, Audrey. And this is a, a map of Ireland from the National Cancer Registry. They have these on their website, and they're very interesting to take a look at. We know that 90% of melanomas are related to skin expo sun exposure. And when you look at this picture of the map of Ireland, the paler areas are areas which have slightly below the average rate of skin cancer. And as the colour gets darker, those are the areas that have a slightly higher rate of skin cancer compared to average. And when you look at this map, you can see clearly that the sunny southeast tends to have higher than average levels of melanoma, whereas up in Donegal, where they wouldn't have much sunshine, they tend to have lower levels of melanoma. Next slide, please, Audrey. So here are our risk factors for lung for skin cancer. What puts you at risk of skin cancer? First of all, sun exposure, be that recreational or sunbed use, a history of sunburn, particularly as a child. In fact, if you have a blistering sunburn just once as a child under the age of 12 years, you double your risk of melanoma in later life. The presence of benign sun damage in the skin. So what's benign sun damage? Well, benign sun damage is a tan. Tan skin is damaged skin. The number of nevi, that would be the number of moles that you have. Uh, some families tend to be what the dermatologists would call moly families. They tend to have a lot of moles all over the body. The density of frecklings or freckling as a child, then your skin, hair and eye colour can contribute. Your ability to tan or not to tan. A family history of melanoma increased your risks and it tends to be commoner in people of high socioeconomic status. Next slide, please, Audrey. So you can bunch the risk factors into three broad groups, your skin type, the sun, and everything else. And I'll just go through them if that's okay. So the next slide, please, Audrey. So the skin type would be you, who you are. And the typical person most at risk would be the person with red hair, freckles, and a tendency to burn, which would be an awful lot of people in Ireland. The next slide, please, Audrey. This is the Fitzpatrick skin type scale, and some of you will have heard of this. This was designed by a chap called Thomas Fitzpatrick, an American dermatologist, and I read somewhere about him. He's the most important dermatologist in the last 100 years. 
he did a lot of work on melanoma and the sun, and he came up with this scale for skin types. And he divided people into skin types one, six, one being the palest, six being the darkest. Now, type one you can see is your pale white skin with blue green eyes and blonde or red hair. These people always burn, they do not tan. They are people who burn, even if the weather forecast said it's going to be sunny tomorrow, they'll start burning listening to that. Type two skin would have fair skin but blue eyes, maybe dark hair or brown hair. They burn easily and they tan badly. And so on till you get down to group six. And these will be the very dark brown or black skin. It's much hardier skin, it never burns and it always tans darkly. Next slide, please, Audrey. And this is uh, the Fitzpatrick skin scale represented in pictures. And it gives you a very good idea of what you're looking at. And I think this is really important in Ireland. In Ireland, 75, 70 to 80% of us would be Fitzpatrick type one or two. So even though we may look at each other and think that we're quite dark skinned, we're actually not. We're all extremely pale skinned in this country. We come in two colors. We come in pale or very pale. And we're really not suited to the sun at all. Um, the scoring zero to six, you go online and you can do it. And they assess your skin color, your hair color, your eye color. They assess your tendency to respond to the sun, whether you tan or not. And they also take a look at whether you deliberately try to tan or not. And that gives you a score between zero and over 35 and will tell you what skin type you are. And the reason for that is that even though you may look at somebody and you say, well, hold on, they have dark hair and they have dark eyes. They can't be a Fitzpatrick one or two. They actually can. You might, that person with the dark hair and dark eyes might burn really quickly. They may have very delicate skin. So it's important to consider how they respond to the sun as well as what they look like. Next slide, please, Audrey. So that's the first risk factor. It's you, it's your genetics, it's who you are and how you're made. And as I say, somewhere between 70 to 80 percent of Ireland are people, of people in Ireland are at risk from the sun. We can't take the sun at all. The next big factor is the sun. Sun exposure really of any kind, sunbed use, sunburn as a child or benign sun related skin changes. Next slide, please, Audrey. So this is the sun. That's what it looks like. I made that slide on a very cold, wet day, because I thought nobody in Ireland would remember what the sun looked like. Of course, it's out tonight, just to wind us all up. Next slide, please, Audrey. Now, why do we need to worry about the sun and how does the sun damage our skin? The sun has three types of ultraviolet rays. That's the UV rays. There's UVA, UVB, and UVC. Ultraviolet C, we can dismiss. It doesn't penetrate the ozone layer, can't do us any harm. Ultraviolet A and ultraviolet B problematic. Ultraviolet B is one that's particularly problematic. That's the one that causes sunburn, melanoma and basal cell carcinoma. Ultraviolet A in the meantime, it causes skin aging and wrinkles and for a long time was thought to be relatively harmless but increasingly it's been recognized that ultraviolet A is associated with skin cancer uh, including melanoma. UVA can penetrate glass and it penetrates the skin more deeply than UVB. And you have to be careful with UV rays. Just because it's not terribly warm doesn't mean that the UV rays aren't out in force. They might be. Um, the warmth we get from the sun is caused from the infrared. The ultraviolet rays do not cause warmth, and obviously you can't see them, you can't feel them, but they're there. The next slide, please, Audrey. And this is an example of what UVA does to your skin. This gentleman, it's a very famous photo of a guy who worked for years as a truck driver and the left side of his face was exposed to the sun through the glass in his cabin in the truck. And you can see there's marked aging on the left side of his face relative to the right side of the face. The next slide please, Audrey. So if you can't see UV and you can't feel it and you can't touch it, how do you know it's there? And the way you know it's there is through the UV index. And you can find the UV index on any given day in Ireland by going on to Met Air and you'll find it very quickly. The UV index will tell us how strong the sun's UV rays are. And when the UV index is three or above, you need to protect your skin from the sun. Typically in Ireland, that will be between 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. And typically it's between April to September. 
even when it's cloudy, the UV index can be high. So even though it may be cloudy and it may be overcast and it may not feel warm, the UV index could still be high enough to cause sun damage. Next slide, please, Audrey. That's the UV index graphically represented. So uh, one to two, it's low UV index. You don't really have to use too much sun protection. Anything over three onwards, we should be protecting ourselves from the sun. The next slide, please, Audrey. So this was a slide that I put together. I think it was on the 27th of May. And this is the UV index taken from the Met Air and website on the 27th of May. And on the left, there's a clear sky. That was what the UV index would have been on that day when the sky was clear. And you can see the entire country practically is orange, except uh, for the people up in Donegal who don't get the whole lot of sun. And for the entire country almost, the UV index was between six and seven. So on a clear day, the 27th of May, if it wasn't cloudy, we were all supposed to be using sun protection. On the right there, you can see the 27th of May, if it was sunny, and on a sunny moment there, I'm sorry, when it was cl cloudy, and when it's cloudy there, about half the country has a low V index, uh, the other half of the country has a UV index between three and five. So really you could argue that on the 27th of May, the easiest thing was just to use sun protection. But for some people in the latter bottom half of the country, they wouldn't have been so much at risk. Next slide, please, Audrey. And this is just a few days ago. Oh, sorry. Did I skip okay. ahead? There you go. Yeah, we'll leave it. We'll move on. Oh, okay. Um, so this is the 3rd of June, just a few days ago. And you can see on the left again, this is how it would look on a clear day. Almost the entire country is orange. Almost the entire country has a UV index of 6 to 7. We're all supposed to be wearing our sun protection. If it's cloudy, you'll notice that even though it's cloudy on that day, the UV rays were still strong enough. They were 3 to 5. And even though it was cloudy and overcast, we were still supposed to be using sun protection. So the next slide, please, Audrey. And the next question is, what does sun protection mean? Well, the HSC and the NCCP are running the Sun Smart campaign to try to promote sun protection and educate the public about sun protection. And this is the Skin Cancer Prevention Plan. And the front page of it is fantastic because this is exactly what sun protection is supposed to look like. The first way to protect yourself from the sun is don't go out in the sun. Stay in, particularly between 11 and 3 in the afternoon just to keep out of the sun if you can. If you have to go outdoors and you can't stay in, then at least try to find shade. So find somewhere if you're sitting by the pool with a sun canopy over you and just be aware as well that the sun's position changes throughout the day and you won't be protected in the same position all day. If you must go out, if you can't find shade, then you need to start by covering up. And that's what these people are doing. So you start from the top down. The lady in the front there is wearing hat, which is really important to cover the scalp. And also it's a broad brimmed hat. So it's wide, it covers her ears, covers the back of her neck, and it even casts some protection over her face. Following that, she has glasses. And it's important that you find sunglasses with a high uh, SPF in them. And also they should be wraparound sunglasses if you can manage that so that the corner of the eye is protected because there is such a thing as retinal melanoma um, and you need sunglasses to protect you from that. You'll notice then what they're wearing, particularly the children from the neck down, almost uh, the little guy in the front, almost to his ankles, is completely covered up. And it's important if you can to get you clothing with UV protection in it. And that's UPF clothing. I'll talk about it in a moment. So cover up as much as you possibly can. And then you start thinking about the sun cream. So the next slide, please, Audrey. And this is it. We all know this from Australia. Slip on clothing that covers you up. Slap on the sunscreen, especially factor of 50 plus for your children. Slap on a wide brimmed hat. Seek shade, especially if you're outdoors between 11 and 3. And slide on sunglasses to protect the eyes where you can. And that little lady has it mostly right. So the next slide, please, Audrey. This is the same thing again. And just to draw your attention, to the last line here, really. Do not deliberately try to get a suntan. Sun tanned skin is damaged skin um, and we all need a change of attitude towards tan. It's not glamorous and it's not attractive. It's sun tanned skin is damaged skin. You should avoid getting sunburn if you can at all and never ever use a sun bed. Next slide please Audrey. Now the UPF clothing. Um, this is a relatively new phenomenon. I think UPF clothing 
uh, came about in the 1990s, so they haven't been around for very long. UPF stands for ultraviolet protection factor, and it measures the amount of radiation that can penetrate the fabric to reach your skin. SPF, the sunblock, measures your burn time, but UPF measures light actually penetrating the fabric. And you know, some clothing has a UPF written on it, particularly again in Australia, they're, they're way ahead on this sort of stuff. But if you don't know whether your clothing is UPF or not, you can hold it up to the sunlight. If you can see through it, then the UV radiation is getting through it. Loose fitting clothing is better because if you're wearing tight tops or tight shorts, fabric gets stretched and the light can penetrate between the fibres. So wear loose fitting clothes if you can. Just remember that if you hop into the pool or into the sea, the water makes cloth more penetrable. Um, so it won't give you as much protection as you think. Dark or bright colours will absorb the sunlight better and densely woven cloth is better, such as polyester, nylon, silk, cotton, mesh cloths or sheer cloths don't provide you with as much protection. On the next slide, please. Audrey. So you can get used PF clothing in Ireland. You can find it labelled as such some of the sports stores, but it's not that commonly used in Ireland. And your last line of defence, and it really is your last line of defence, is what is sun cream? What is SPF and putting on the sun cream? So it's not the case that the sun comes out and you put on your sun cream, you're good to go. If the sun comes out, you really should keep away from the sun. And the sun cream is the last thing standing between you and those harmful rays. As I said earlier, there's two types of UV rays you need to worry about, your UVB and UVA. I'm conscious I'm talking to pharmacists and you know more about this than I do, so I apologise if I'm boring you but it's no harm to recap anyway. UVB is the one that's most implicated for melanoma. And the SPF that you see on your tub of sun cream, that refers to UVB protection. Typically ranges from two to 50, but you can get 60 or 70 or even 100 plus, I've seen it. Um, adults should at least wear 30 plus and children should at least wear 50 plus. The star rating then, as you all know, that is the UVA protection and that ranges from zero to five. It's important to remember that the UVA protection is compared to the SPF. So it's not an absolute figure, it's more like a ratio. So if your SPF is very, very low, if your SPF is 10 and your UVA is four, that's nowhere near as good as if your SPF is 50 and your UVA is four. So it's just really important to get both, to make sure you've got a high SPF and a high UVA. If you don't have a star rating on your UVA, if you just have the circle with the letters UVA in it, that means that your UVA protection is at least one third of your SPF protection. The next slide, please, Audrey. How do they work? I mean, in a nutshell, and again, I'm conscious you know more about this than any of us, um, there's two things. Uh, one is that they absorb harmful UV radiation, and the other is that they reflect UV radiation. So SPF and, and uh, the UVA ratings, they're like sponges. They mop up UV, ration, UV radiation as it hits your skin. Um, you can find some sun creams that have zinc oxide or titanium, and they would be like a mirror. So the first ones would be like a mop. These ones are like a mirror. The radiation bounces off them and is reflected back out into the atmosphere. Um, the zinc oxide ones are the ones that you'd see on the, the sailors. They'd have that blue streak on their nose. Um, that's, what, that's what those ones are. So the next slide, please. And this is really important. How do I apply sun cream? Um, we did a very um, unscientific focus group in the National Plowing Championships a year ago. But we took down the sub, tub of sun cream and we just put it on the desk and let people use it. And it was really interesting. The ladies put a very neat amount onto their hands and rubbed it in very carefully. They were expert at it. And of course, women over their lifetimes cream on their faces thousands and thousands of times, and they're very, very skilled at it. The men really weren't very good at it. They didn't know how much to apply or how to rub it on or what to do with it. This is roughly what you do with sun cream. Um, the average adult would use about six full teaspoons, about 36 grams to cover the entire body. So a half a teaspoon to each arm and a half a teaspoon to the face and the neck and don't forget the ears. A teaspoon to each leg, a teaspoon to the front of the body, a teaspoon to the back of the body. You put it on 15 to 30 minutes before that I allow you in. And this is where we all fall down. We do not put on enough to begin with 
and then we don't reapply it every two hours. You also have to remember to reapply after toweling and swimming, reapply after sweating. And if you think about it, we know it's not quite accurate, but if you imagine the way one, one mil of water weighs, weighs one gram, if you just imagine one mil of sun cream weighs one gram, that, that won't be quite right. But let's just say 36 grams of sun cream is 36 mils. But then your average bottle of 200 mils of sun cream should not last you more than a week when you go on your holidays. And that's if you just apply it once every day. So if you buy a tub of sun cream of about 200 mils, there's absolutely no way that that should be coming home with you at the end of your holidays. It should be used. But um, they don't get used. People don't apply them often enough. So the next slide, please, Audrey. So that's the sun and sun cream and what to do about it. These are the SunSmart resources. They're on uh, the HSE website, hse.ie SunSmart. Um, or you can also follow them on hse.ie forward slash answer. So the next slide, please, Audrey. And then finally, the last risk factors would be the family history of melanoma um, and high socioeconomic status. The next slide, please, Audrey. High socioeconomic status was always associated with a higher risk of skin cancer. And it's not really known why, but it's thought that in the good old days, the only people who could afford a sun holiday were wealthy people. Increasingly now, everybody can afford a sun holiday. So it's expected that that will flatten out. Family history. What does a family history mean? You have a higher chance of melanoma if somebody in your family who is a first degree relative has had melanoma. And first degree relative is a parent, a sibling or a child. You have a higher risk if the index case, that's the first family member, was aged less than 30 years when they were diagnosed. And you have a higher risk again, obviously, if more than one first degree relative is affected. So the next slide, please. So sunbeds deserve a special mention. Um, people should keep away from sunbeds. IARC, which is the International Association for Research on Cancer, classifies sunbeds as a class one carcinogen. They're in the same category as tobacco smoke, and plutonium. They're extremely dangerous. Uh, following the Public Health Act 2014, they are banned in people under the age of 18 in Ireland. Um, as I understand it in Italy, sunbeds are banned entirely for people with type 1 or type 2 skin, which would account for almost everybody in Ireland. We wouldn't be allowed to use them in Italy. And I think they're banned in Australia altogether. And there was one study in France in 2015 where they found that in 2015 alone, the use of sunbeds accounted for almost 300 skin cancers in that year. So they are highly dangerous. The next slide, please. Now we're going to play spot the skin cancer. This is what melanoma looks like. So these, this is the ABCD that you'll all have heard about. Uh, a mold that you'd be worried about or a skin lesion that you'd be worried about would have these features typically. First of all, they'd be asymmetrical in two axes. They'd have an irregular border. C would be their color. They'd have at least two different colors within the lesion itself. D would be their size, their diameter. They'd be uh, greater than six millimeters. And E would be evolution. So if it's changing, so like those ones I was mentioning earlier, the squamous cell and basal cell melanoma, that they don't get smaller. They, they change, they get bigger. So the next slide, please, Audrey. Now, this is the first one. And you can see here, it has the asymmetry in both axes. It certainly has an irregular border. It's not a perfect circle or square or anything. There's certainly two different colors in the lesion. Now we don't have a size, and of course we don't know if it's evolving over time, but this is indeed a melanoma. If you click again, Audrey, see if this works. There's another one. And again, this has asymmetry in two axes, has an irregular border, certainly two very pronounced different colors. And again, we don't have a diameter. We don't know what it's doing over time. But of all the boxes that we can tick, we have ticked. So yeah, this is a melanoma. And the next one, please, Audrey, click again. This is the last one here. Again, it ticks the three boxes that we can tick. It's asymmetrical, it has an irregular border, and there's at least two different colors. And in addition, this one here, it's about a centimeter in diameter. So it's well over that six millimeters in size. And again, that's a melanoma. So the next slide, please, Audrey. Now this one, this one is interesting. I wouldn't say that this looks asymmetrical. I don't think it has an irregular border. 
it does have two different colors, mind you. And if you imagine what your toenail looks like, it can't be more than six millimeters, you would say. Um, but this is in fact a melanoma. This is a melanoma under the toenail. And it would be very easy to miss this. You could be forgiven for thinking somebody stubbed their toe and they just bled under the toenail and that's all it is. But this is in fact a melanoma and needs to be dealt with. And I suppose it goes back to the basic message that if something funny looking appears on the skin, it should be removed. Next one, please, Audrey. And this one is uh, the scariest of the lot. I mean, yes, you could say that this has asymmetry, although when you look just at the main bit of it, it looks kind of circular. You mightn't think it has an irregular border, you might. Um, I suppose it has two different colors. It's pink and pale pink, but it's certainly not black or, or terribly ugly looking. But this is in fact a melanoma as well. This is a very unusual type of melanoma called an amelanotic melanoma. Amelanotic means there's no colored cells in this, but it is a melanoma, all right. Those, those are malignant skin cells. And again, it just shows you if there's something on the skin that is different, that's kind of ugly looking, that isn't going away, it should be at least looked at and very probably removed. At least in the case of this one, you can see a couple of freckles. There's one at the seven o'clock position and it's very different to the surrounding skin and surrounding skin freckles. You could say that, but it would be easy to be deceived by that one. The next slide, please, Audrey. And this one here, this is interesting. This has uh, asymmetry for sure. It has an irregular border. Certainly there's two different colors, we can't say what size it is, but it looks big. If you compare it to the freckles surrounding it, it looks good and big. But this actually isn't a melanoma. This is called a seborrheic keratosis. They're entirely benign, entirely harmless. They're very ugly looking and they really frighten people. Um, but they're harmless. And really, again, you've, you're hardly going to know. You, this would just have to be removed to know for sure, I think. So the next slide, please, Audrey. So where do pharmacists? come in in all of this? Well, we said this before. The next slide, please, Audrey. You guys are highly influential amongst the Irish public and you've an enormous reach into the Irish public. And we know this because we read the survey that was done on pharmacy usage and attitudes in Ireland. Next slide, please, Audrey. This is from 2020, and this is the pharmacy usage in Ireland in the past week by age. The percentage of people who visited a pharmacy in the last week and you can see compared to the GPs, I mean, whopping numbers of people visit the pharmacy. From the age of 25 onwards, over half of the population will have visited a pharmacy in the last week. And be that they're poking around in the sun protection and creams, that they're looking for UPF clothing, they just, I'd imagine that people pull up their sleeve and wave funny lesions on their arms and legs, actually. They're coming to the pharmacist and they're going to be talking to you. So you have huge power and influence there. Next slide, please, Audrey. Um, this puts it in a nutshell. About 2.1 million people visited a pharmacy in the last week alone in Ireland. The attendance increases rapidly with age. 98, a whopping 98% of people trust the advice and patient care they receive from the pharmacist. And 98% would say that they value the professional advice they receive from the pharmacists. I mean, even if those figures are off by a factor of 10%, they're still extraordinary figures. The next slide, please, Audrey. This is the sort of thing that we, we imagine might happen. They might pop in to see you with a skin lesion of some description. They might use some class of a cream or a topical treatment on that skin lesion. And then hopefully they'd come back to you. It's the same or it's worse, it's getting bigger, it's bleeding, it's crusting over, it doesn't look right. And at that point, it's just kind of think, hold on, this doesn't look right, this needs to get checked out and hopefully they come in then to see us. Um, and you'd be amazed what you might say to somebody that might just be the nudge that they would need to get a thing checked. I, I had a gentleman, I was thinking about him the other day in his seventies, he had a lesion on his ear, wouldn't get it removed, wasn't interested in what I thought, but what I felt he should be doing, not bothered, not engaging. But he went to see a, a geriatrician actually, who told him that it was detracting from his appearance, and he totally bought into it. Uh, totally bought, this guy was nearly 80, totally bought into the idea that this thing on his ear was ruining his handsome good looks and got it whipped off in no time. 
you just don't know the thing you would say to somebody that might be the thing they need to hear. Next slide, please, Audrey. The good news in terms of skin lesions is that there's a lot of help out there. There are 14 pigmented lesion clinics around the country and GPs have access to this form. We fill it out, we send it in, Dermatologists have a look at it. And if there's a lesion that they're concerned about, people will get seen to within two weeks and they will have it whipped off really, really quickly. There's great care out there. The next slide, please. And the outlook is, 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 is getting better and better. That great care is shown in these figures. You can see the five-year survival by stage at diagnosis for the various different common cancers. And look at the top there. If skin is diagnosed at stage one, there's a 99% five-year survival. And I can tell you that that figure is about the same at 10 years. It's a 99% 10-year survival for stage one skin cancer. Even if you're diagnosed at stage four, the survival rates are pretty good. They're the best of the lot at 63%. But obviously we want to get people at stage one where there's a 99% survival, they're sorted. The outlook is really, really positive. Next slide, please, Audrey. And this is a really hopeful slide. I think this comes from Australia, the Australian equivalent of the National Cancer Registry in Ireland. This is what happened with skin cancer in Ireland, in Australia. You can see the green line and that's women. It's pretty much stable, tipping along, but it is actually going down. This is the mortality from skin cancer in Australia. It's falling. You look at the red for men, the mortality was climbing and climbing and climbing and climbing. And then suddenly around 2012, they turned it around and now it's falling. Mortality from skin cancer is falling from Australia. So there's huge opportunity here to do something similar in Ireland. We shouldn't be getting skin cancer. 90% 90 90 of cases are preventable. And if we do get skin cancer, it's sitting right in front of us. It's right under our noses. We should be able to spot it and have it whipped off and sorted really, really quickly. And we would appreciate, I think, any help pharmacists can offer us in that regard. So the next slide, please, Audrey. If there is more information on cancer in general at hse.ie forward slash cancer and information about the SunSmart campaign is on that site also hse.ie forward slash sunsmart. And that's me. And if there are any questions, that would be great. Thank you very much for sticking around on a lovely evening. Thank you so much, Una. That's great. Thanks very much for that. Um, really, really interesting. So, so much information and insights and lots of very useful reminders, especially this time of year. Um, I'm having a look in the chat. There doesn't seem to be any questions yet, but we do have a little bit of time. So if anybody has any questions, perhaps in the meantime, while we're waiting, um, Audrey, if you wanted to share, there's just yeah. a few slides that I'll go through, um, but definitely feel free to type into the chat if there's any questions that you'd like to put to our presenters this evening. Um, so this first slide here will never use, it will never miss an opportunity uh, to remind you that perhaps you might like to uh, start a CPD cycle on this topic after viewing the webinar this evening um, to just have a think about what impact this might have on your practice. Um, the next slide then just gives you a reminder about our webinar survey. Uh, so especially given that this is the last um, webinar of the season, we would really appreciate if you did take the time to fill out the survey. I've just uh, included the link there in the chat. Um, so it would be great to get some feedback about the webinar this evening um, or even about the um, webinar series in general. So what maybe worked well, what you think we might do differently. And if there's any topics that you feel we haven't yet covered um, that really do deserve a webinar of their own. Um, if you want to move on to the next slide then, I don't want to give you a survey fatigue, but there is another survey that we would uh, be grateful if you if you did have a chance to complete. Um, as you might have seen in um, an email that we would have sent there in the last week, um, there is this IOP CPD offering survey. So RCSI is currently contracted by the PSI as a management body for the IOP. And as a designated awarding body, or CSI is required to review the effectiveness of its internal quality assurance policies and procedures through cyclical reviews of schools and faculties and administrative units. So as one of the units, um, our activities are currently being reviewed. And I'm just going to pop in a link to that survey. Um, so we would be grateful if you did get a chance um, to complete that survey. 
Um, the, one of the final slides then I have, um, as you know, this is the last webinar of the season, but I'm really, really excited to let you know about a new initiative which is being launched in a few weeks time. You might have um, seen the article about this in our most recent newsletter. So the Resilient Pharmacist podcast is going to be launched um, in two or three weeks time. And um, this is a collaborative project um, with the IOP Mental Health Working Group and the IOP Mental Health Ambassador Network. Um, I don't want to give too much away, but each episode features different pharmacists in conversation with Katrina, speaking about their experience in building resilience. Some of the topics could include um, stress, anxiety, depression, bereavement, and we get the opportunity to hear real stories about how these pharmacists have experienced growth through adversity. Um, so I had the opportunity to get a sneak peek into some of the episodes, and I think it really is something special. Um, so if you stay tuned, we will have a trailer, um, hopefully in about two weeks time, and there'll be further information about where you'll be able to download the episodes. Um, so I think the next slide is just to thank you all for attending this evening and to thank our presenters. Um, but I do see there are a few questions in the chat box. So I suppose um, we certainly have a few minutes, so I might go through some of the questions if that suits. Um, so the first question here, the SPF that says once daily applica application, and it does give an example of a particular brand, um, do you still apply this every two hours? Uh, the, the answer is, is yes. I don't know that particular brand, so I can't comment that particular one, but the answer is yes, partly because while the UVB protection, they say, sticks around, the UVA does tend to wear even in the one daily ones, but also because we don't put it on thickly enough to begin with, and because we miss bits, and you might hope is that you'll get them the second time round, and also because we tend to wipe off some of the UPF or SPF in towels and on clothing and so forth. So yeah, even with the ones daily, and I suppose parties to keep the message consistent. Yes, just put it back on again after two hours. Okay, thanks, Una. And um, the next question, if Irish people should essentially cover up every day between April and September, what does this mean for vitamin D deficiency? Yeah, that's a real headache in Ireland. And um, I, I mean, what they say in Ireland is that we can't get enough skin, a sun anyway in Ireland. And you know that we make vitamin, we can't eat vitamin D in our diet. It's very hard to get it in food. So the way we get our vitamin D in this country is the sunlight hits our skin and we make our own vitamin D in our skin. And obviously if the sunlight doesn't hit your skin, you're not able to make your own vitamin D. Seemingly though, in the Northern hemisphere, when you're this far away from the equator, seemingly it's just almost impossible for us to get enough vitamin D in the sunlight anyway. We're not going to be able to make enough of it. And what the dermatologists would say is that from September through April, we should all be on vitamin D supplements. And in fact, I was once told by a dermatologist, just stop checking vitamin D levels on people, just tell them to take supplements. And um, I tried very hard not to check vitamin D levels on people because they always come back low. We just don't have enough vitamin D. We don't need to take supplements. By the way, I, I should have said as well that SPF isn't recommended in babies under the age of six months. Um, they're just meant to cover up. So they're meant to stay in their buggy and co get covered up with shade or UPF clothing or whatever. Okay, thanks for that, Una. Um, another question here, are there parts of the body, for example, the face that are more sensitive to the sun? Yeah, you're right. And I think that, and, and it is, and it's, it's the face, it's what they call the noble area. So if you imagine the triangle from the inner corner of the mouth, it's on my video, maybe you can show it, the inner corner of the eye to the outer corner of the eye to here, that, that, that area, the bit when you look up at the sun, it comes right down at you like that. That's the bit that's particularly sensitive. But look, remember, Irish skin, we're all type one and type two, um, we're all sensitive all over. We cannot take the sun. And, you know, there are more people coming from farther away into Ireland, We've got more immigration nowadays. But, you know, if you have a child who's a mixture of type one and say type six skin, that doesn't necessarily mean that that child has a whole lot of sun protection. They need to be careful as well. Um, so even though that child may have dark hair, dark eyes, the skin could actually be far more vulnerable than their type six parent. Cool. Thanks for that. Um, so the next question, is there a particular brand of SPF that the NCCP recommends over others? That's something no. you're allowed to do. No. No. Okay. Um, has COVID affected the time for people to be seen in secondary care following referral from GPs? Um, not so much for cancer. Um, for breast, lung, prostate and for skin, the standard is that if there's an urgent referral sent in, 
And if they're urgent, they're supposed to be seen within two weeks. And they have mostly been sticking to that throughout COVID. It's really been remarkable. They've been, they've been keeping to that and they've been managing despite everything. One of the biggest problems, though, has been getting people to come and um, see GPs. And again, that's where yourselves may be able to help out. It is actually really is a worry. And it's not like GPs aren't busy and we're not looking for more work. But it is a concern that there are people out there with symptoms who aren't coming to see their GPs. I'm oh, sorry, Una, you're you're freezing there on my screen anyway. Yeah, me too. It could just be the connection. Um, Heather, did you perhaps want to take any of the uh, other questions in the chat box if you want me to uh, call them out? Yeah, I'll have a quick look. And just to add in relation to vitamin D, actually, Elisa, um, the Oireachtas Joint Committee on Health recently published a report on that just in April of this year. And it was making the point that the entire adult population are vitamin D deficient. And, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we were to see a recommendation arising at some stage about, you know, just taking a supplement, you know, the, um, for everybody. It's recommended for higher risk groups and elderly people. But um, this committee uh, has has some interesting findings, and I think that that report makes some interesting recommendations. So it's a space to watch, but I think recommending vitamin D supplementation is never a bad idea for the Irish population. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, Heather. Um, so there's um, a few people here asking about beta carotenes. So whether there is any benefit to prevent sunburns um, as a way of perhaps preparing the skin to the sun. We would just recommend really SPF, uh, the, the sun cream, um, the sun cream and all the other um, factors that Una has spoken about. So the slip, slop, slap, slide and um, beta carotene really isn't part of our, our current kind of suite of recommendations. And um, so the SunSmart campaign, all those materials that are available on the NCCP website, they can all be printed out. There's, you know, infographics that people could print out and stick up in the pharmacy or whatever, and it, it goes through all the different things that we'd recommend. So, so really, no, I think um, the main things we would suggest is preventing exposure to the sun in the first place through the, the clothes and the, the hats and the shades and then the, the sun cream as well is very important. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Heather. And um, just a question there about that report you mentioned. Um, where would it be possible to get a copy of that report? Um, I think it's published. Um... I can check that out and um, yeah the full report I see it there so um I just looked it up on the government website it's on um oroctus.ie as well so if you go to oroctus.ie um you'll be able to find the full report there and like I say that's very recent I think it was just April of this year the full report's available to download perfect and uh, so there's just one or two more questions which you might try to squeeze in in the last minute and um, sunglasses is there a specific grade of SPF for sunglasses are there any additional benefits if they're polarized okay that's a good question um I'm not exactly sure of the answer to that actually um I know there are it does have to have the SPF factor in it you'll see uh, a lot of the sunglasses have stickers on them saying what level of, of protection they do offer. I'm not exactly sure in sunglasses what the the minimum recommendation is, but um, as <laughs> no, oh yeah, no, I'm back. Yeah, I, I disappeared. I came back. And um, the yeah. British Association of Dermatologists have some standards. I don't think we have them in Ireland as such. So they want a thing. It's a CE mark, which is I think is a European mark, but I don't know why they want that anymore. And British standard, it has to have a UV 400 label and 100% UV protection written on the label or the sticker. So that's it, UV 400 and 100% UV protection. Okay. Excellent. Yeah, you see things written on sunglasses. I, I never really pay much attention, I have to be honest, but yeah, I'm sure there's something like that written there. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, Una, for that. Um, there's also just a query here, advice to give when it has been suggested that sunscreens cause cancer, which I suppose is... Um, I I've not come across sunscreens causing cancer. I don't know about you, Heather. I haven't. No, I, I haven't come across that. I like causing skin cancer, causing or just being carcinogenic in general. I haven't heard of anything in that regard now. Yeah. Um, now, one or two more. Uh, should new sunscreen be bought each year? Does it lose its potency over time? Yes, 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 yes to both of those. Yeah, it does lose its potency over time. And when you open them, um, I know there's always a bit of you that thinks it's, they're just trying to make more money out of you. But when you open, there's a 12 month little symbol on, on most of them. So once it's been open for a year, yeah, you should get a new sunscreen. 
it is supposed to be supposed to see, yeah. Great. Um, so we're just coming up on nine o'clock. Um, now, there is one or two more questions there. Um, one of them might be very easy to answer. It's something I've never heard of. Is there an opinion? On, do you have an opinion on polypodium leukotomas? Never heard of it. I'm sorry. Yeah, either. OK. And then finally, which I know is something I had actually asked when we had the, the pre-webinar um, uh, the meeting to discuss the webinar tips to open a conversation with somebody about a mole on the face which is dark and large we might finish on that question then yeah that's a difficult one and i know it's hard you, you don't want to be like oh look at that thing on your face <laughs> but there's definitely ways i think it's just um i had a colleague in work who had quite a large notable mole on her on her chest and i just kind of casually brought it up in conversation just said oh i just wonder have you ever got got that checked and she was actually very like actually lots of people had said it to her you know so sometimes if it's quite a, an obvious lesion like that chances are someone will have said it to them before you um i know it's hard it's just about how to approach people or how to bring it up but i think in your capacity as healthcare professionals it would be very acceptable to say to somebody who would come into the pharmacy oh um you know we just a bit careful about moles and I'm sure you put sun cream on that but um you know if you notice that it was large or changing or anything like that and um, might be a good idea to just get it seen by by the GP uh, like as Una pointed out in those findings from the pharmacy survey you're you're highly trusted and well-regarded healthcare professionals and I think as I say in that capacity it'd be a very acceptable conversation to have. Yeah you might be surprised as pharmacists you might underrate how willing people are to listen to what you have to say and how quickly they will believe you and accept what you have to say and, and trust you. Um, so I think you might get away with more with your patients than perhaps you would with your mum or your dad. But I, I think you'd be surprised at how delighted they'd be to have a chat with you and to listen to what you have to say. Certainly at my end, um, that would be my experience of people's relationship with the pharmacist. They're delighted that, that you might pay a bit of attention. So. Um, I think they'd be absolutely thrilled to, to have you open the conversation. Yeah, that's great. Um, well, I we do always try to stick to time. So I suppose what I would like to do is thank the, our presenters um, so much for the really, really interesting and insightful presentation this evening and indeed for answering all of the questions. Um, if there are any burning questions that you feel weren't covered or that you just think of after the webinar, um, do reach out and we'll see if we'd be able to get them answered um, for you. I'd also like to thank each and every pharmacist on here tonight and all the pharmacists who are watching back the webinars um, for your support, not just this evening, but for every webinar. Um, taking the time on a Wednesday evening, especially in lovely evenings like today, um, to kind of think about your CPD and tune in and, and listen to us. Um, we do really appreciate it. Um, if you do get a chance to fill out the webinar survey, that would be really good just to let us know, um, you know what, what you might like to see from this in the future. Um, and otherwise, I hope you have a lovely summer. Uh, you'll certainly be hearing a lot from us, but I suppose we might be seeing you virtually for a little while. Um, so thank you so much. And um, thank you again to our presenters. And I think we'll finish there. Thank you very much. Thanks, thank Alicia. Thanks, everyone.